1605, Miguel Cervantes gave us really an enduring image of what the Middle Ages were like. The book in two volumes told the story of Don Quixote. And Don Quixote is a Spanishman. He's a nobleman, a Hidalgo, as they were known then. And Don Quixote in the story begins to read lots of chivalric novels. That is, stories of all kinds of folks from the past, usually from Spanish history, of knights rescuing damsels, going out to attack beasts. And of course, the image that Cervantes gives us is comical. The story tells of numerous accounts that are really designed to make us laugh at the Middle Ages. His sidekick, Sancho Panza, really plays the comedic straight man for us in this story. And the famous cases of Don Quixote attacking unwitting passers-by, in one case attacking a group of monks and sort of whipping them and a couple of them running off into the fields to get away from this crazy man, are matched with the pretty famous case of Don Quixote getting on his steed, grabbing a lance, and tilting at a windmill. And this story really is a bit of an analogy, really, to how most of us might view the Middle Ages. The common misconception of the Middle Ages is that it is a boring, backward, kind of filthy period of time in which people died young when all that you had before you to look forward to if you were born in the Middle Ages was farming for a period of time, usually under a feudal lord, and then essentially passing on by the age of, let's say, 40. And that image of the Middle Ages has been enforced by the way in which many of the comedic and Hollywood stories of the Middle Ages have also played. We've all seen probably the Monty Python stories of the Middle Ages, the Holy Grail stories, where any number of caricatures of the Middle Ages are sort of paraded in front of us. One, you know, bring out your dead, where it seems that everyone is sort of dying of the plague, and all that is left for those who do not have the plague is to cart around a wheelbarrow and pick up the dead people, and lots of other things like this. And I don't doubt that for many of us, the Middle Ages presents an enigma. That is to say, it's a period in which it's probably safe to assume that we find it to be the Dark Ages. But in reality, the Middle Ages are actually quite exciting. The world is not lacking in hygiene, money, art, medicine, and having a surplus of war, misogyny, superstition, and chastity belts. By our standards today, of course, the Middle Ages are strange. They do lots of things that we're not used to seeing. They have a number of beliefs that are strange and foreign to us. The church looks different to the way it does today in the 21st century. Peasants, the, the married life, the agrarian ways in which people would live off the land and essentially live hand to mouth in some cases is something we're not used to sort of experiencing. The authoritarianism of the Middle Ages also strikes us as a bit out of touch. We're so used to the modern concept of liberty and freedom that whenever we find a culture, uh, even a period of time across multiple cultures, where there is what appears to us to be a lack of liberty, or in some cases oppression, we tend to find as not a very exciting place. I always remind students that this is intellectual snobbery. This is chronological snobbery, as one person once put it. Just because something from the past is unfamiliar doesn't mean that it is necessarily strange in the ultimate sense of the word. That is to say, just because something doesn't look like us, doesn't act like us, does not mean that it is somehow inferior. And I also point out to students that the fact of the matter is, given that we live in a computer age, in a technology age, Really, the fact that I'm even delivering this content to you through videos, it makes our world utterly strange to just about any period of time prior to this age. Go back just three or four generations, and you're likely to find a period of time in which everything seems to be archaic and boring, in which you sort of wonder, what did they do with themselves throughout the day if they didn't have their computers and entertainment and constant communication and all the things that we're so used to having? So we just have to simply acknowledge the fact that the past is going to be strange. Some periods of the past will be stranger than others. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't have to look back in derision. And in fact, the Middle Ages are 
really not all that strange when you actually get into it and look at it. If you just think about it, the number of things that come to us down from the Middle Ages that are cherished today or that are believed to be exciting and interesting are numerous. Just think of the development in the Middle Ages of literature. You have the epic Beowulf, Canterbury Tales, stories of King Arthur and Robin Hood, When you look at Dante, you have the trilogy in which he lays out not only his theology, not only his view of the afterlife, but also he weaves into it very shrewdly a critique of many of the things that were happening in his own day. We have the developments in theology. Now, some of these are looked on with suspicion by Protestants, but they are nonetheless important and very, very interesting if we're going to understand the Reformation itself. We have the development of scholasticism. We have Thomas Aquinas, William of Ockham, all kinds of figures and theologians who shaped the intellectual Western world in the church and who really were the sources for much of Luther's early training as well as the other reformers. Now, Luther and others would later react against major portions of this period of theological development, but that doesn't mean it's uninteresting. It just means that it's problematic when we look at it through the lens of the Reformation. And there are other things as well, cathedrals, stained glass, architectural developments like Gothic, developments in music. Think about the importance of the Crusades, the rise of Islam as it comes to the West and at times attacks the West directly. And then, of course, the response by the West heading off into crusade, trying to reestablish the Christian world in the Near East. Think of knights warfare, all kinds of things that we consider to be at least inherently interesting, though not necessarily the things that always take up the bulk of our attention. There are also positive theological developments from the standpoint of Protestantism. There has been a lot of work done on what we call the forerunners to the Reformation, people like John Wycliffe and the theological movement of Jan Hus, All of these movements shaped and changed and developed and worked against the Catholic Church in many of the same ways that Luther and Calvin and Cranmer and the other Protestant reformers would just centuries later. So when you lay all of these things out, and many others really, you get a more composite picture of what the Middle Ages should look like to us. The Middle Ages should not be weird. They should not be strange, and again, in the ultimate sense of the word, though they will be unfamiliar. As we go through the lectures on this period of time, and as we look at the Middle Ages, I think one of the things that most students find is that some of the things they care deeply about today actually have roots, or at least have developments in the Middle Ages that would not have occurred were it not for this period of time. And in fact, I often find that after going through the early church, Most people find the developments in the early church and the struggles there to be more foreign, more strange to them than even the Middle Ages. The hierarchical development of the Roman Empire, for example, that to many people and the sort of resultant effect of the authoritarian structure of politics and the way the church and state became intermingled in the early church period of time, and the development of relic veneration and the veneration of the saints and some of the other early developments in the 4th and 5th centuries in particular, often for at least the Protestant perspective, tends to be a little bit more shaky ground. And then when they get into the Middle Ages, at least they find something that they have some preconceptions on that they can then develop and shape, but which then sort of draws all this period out. If we're going to look at the Middle Ages, we have to understand what the period of time is, though. And so I want to give you just sort of three brackets, three periods of time that are vital, I think, to at least conceptualizing in your mind's eye what the Middle Ages is in particular, at least in terms of the sweep of it. Historians typically break the Middle Ages down into three periods of time. Now, I want to go ahead and caution you that these periods of time are arbitrary in some ways. They are artificial. These are the inventions of historians. But these periods of time, these subsets of the Middle Ages, really make the period more manageable. But still, no one that lives, say, in the year 1001 would say, boy, this is great that I live in a different period of time than I lived just two years ago. 
The fact of the matter is, is these again are artificial ways of understanding the past. But nonetheless, let me go ahead and give you three periods of time, three brackets by which to understand the sweep of the Middle Ages. The first is what we today call the Early Middle Ages, very easily titled. And this runs from 500 to 1000 AD. It's a large period of time. If you're going to describe any period of time as being the Dark Ages, it's probably going to be this period of time, what, 500 to 1000. The reason why it's sometimes referred to the Dark Ages is not due to any moral decline, not due necessarily to spiritual decline, at least not in the terms of apathy or in terms of church involvement or theological engagement. There were people that loved Christ at this time. There were people who read the scriptures and attempted to understand them in the light of their own day. But nonetheless, the years 500 to 1000, the early Middle Ages, present some challenges for us, mostly due to the fact that a lot of what we would hope to find historically there just aren't there. The, the best example of this is written sources. From 500 to 1000, we have significantly fewer written sources, at least from a variety standpoint. We, we have, uh, we'd certainly have resources. It's not like it, everyone stopped writing. But what happens from 500 to 1000 is you have a series of wars, you have a series of national calamities, you have obviously the ongoing fallout from the destruction of Rome as the imperial sort of unifier of all of the world, both east and west. And as a result, you have all of these changes that occur in this period of time, the early Middle Ages, that really are cataclysmic in some ways. And while they're cataclysmic, they're very important. It's this period of time in which you see the rise of what would eventually become the modern nations as we know them today. Modern nations being like France and Germany and England. All of these countries, all of these regions began to be shaped during this period of time. You see lots of linguistic changes. People moving from Latin to more use or more concentrated use of the vernacular language. Now, there are some efforts to resist that particularly in Charlemagne, who we'll talk about in the later lecture. He attempts, and his scriptorium attempt, to sort of codify and crystallize and perpetuate for the future generations use of Latin, but they could not hold it off. And over time, the vernacular languages of Europe as a whole began to still develop. Still, this period of time, despite the fact that it is quite challenging to understand from a literary standpoint or from a theological standpoint, nevertheless, as we'll see in the lectures, there is actually a great deal of material that we can draw on to understand what is occurring in this period of time. So 500 to 1000 is the early Middle Ages. Next, we have what is often referred to as the High Middle Ages. This runs from 1000 to 1300. Now, in the past, the phrase High Middle Ages had a sort of a moral value to it. This was the period of time in which the Middle Ages were at its best, that you have a flourishing of art and literature, you have a flourishing of church activity, theological activity, you have the rise and the development of scholasticism, for example, and a number of important developments in theological thinking in the West. You also have more or less the stabilization of certain nations or certain countries in the western part of Europe. You have kings, hereditary kingships in many cases, that arise. And these hereditary kingships begin to develop their own dynasties and their own cultural awareness of who they are. You have wars, you have developments. You, this, this period of time, the High Middle Ages, is the time of the Crusades. It's the time of any of a number of, of, of really sort of interesting, but as well as troubling developments in the Middle Ages that have to be understood. Lastly, we have the appropriately named Latter Middle Ages. The Latter Middle Ages run from 1300 to 1500. This period of time is really the one that's most debated today by historians. The latter Middle Ages can be seen either on the one hand as the decay, as the diminution of the church's power, as the waning of theological, um, or theological orthodoxy, as the corruption of the church. And there are a lot of historians that, that, that take this line of approach. They see the latter Middle Ages, in other words, as sort of the forerunner or the, the cultural slide that occurs before Luther and the Reformation. 
still, that interpretation is up for debate, and it's actually on the decline today. Most historians, when they look at the latter Middle Ages, don't see necessarily a decline in engagement or theological thinking or development in the later Middle Ages. Rather, they see changes. They see a lot of flowering of medieval thought. They see developments occurring, but these developments are not reactionary necessarily. This is not the slouching towards Gomorrah kind of period of time. Now, there are troubling things that occur during this period, and we'll talk about some of those. But by and large, the latter Middle Ages should not be seen as some sort of cesspool of bad thinking and bad morals. Fact of the matter is, is that the latter Middle Ages have a great deal of variety and a great deal of developments for us, both positive and negative, that set the stage for Luther and the Reformation. Most historians today, I say, usually refer to the latter Middle Ages as the flowering of the Middle Ages, or as the, as one historian put it, the harvest of the Middle Ages. That this is a period of time in which the groundwork of what was laid before by Aquinas and others is now harvested and extended and expanded and utilized. Others have referred to it as the headwaters, as the time when a great deal of developments occur. Now, obviously, Luther and others will react against the latter Middle Ages, but they react against the Middle Ages as a whole. So there's no reason to see only one period of the Middle Ages as being the worst time or as the the time that really kind of got it wrong. Honestly, a lot of what's driving this perspective that the latter Middle Ages or the time of great turmoil and corruption really comes from an ecumenical desire by some historians to both understand the Reformation, but kind of not find fault with Luther at the same time. So there were some Catholic historians in the 20th century, for example, who alleged or in some cases strongly argued that Luther's Reformation couldn't be understood because the latter Middle Ages were so corrupted and so backwards and that they had lost the pristine theological developments of Aquinas and others in the high Middle Ages. The fact of the matter is the latter Middle Ages really are part and parcel to the medieval movement, part and parcel to the medieval church. And so we can't pin all of the sins of the Middle Ages onto the latter period, particularly since the Crusades and a number of troubling things happened in the high Middle Ages during the so-called pristine years. And you can't pin those on the latter Middle Ages, at least not in full. So if that is the sweep of the history of the time periods of the Middle Ages, A few things can be said about what we're going to be looking at in general. The lectures on the Middle Ages that we're going to be covering run the gamut, really, of the experience of those who lived during the Middle Ages. The first thing we're going to be looking at is, of course, the development of the rise of Charlemagne and the Carolingian Empire. And what we're going to be looking at from that vantage point is the development of European political entities. How did all these nations arise? How did all of these local communities that were formerly Roman shape themselves into what would become the medieval dynasties? So we're going to be looking at Spain as it became first dominated by Aryans and then by the Muslims. We're going to be looking at Anglo-Saxon England. We're going to be looking at Scandinavian culture and the Vikings. And we're going to be looking at a number of other things in the rise of nations. And then moving on into the Middle Ages, the higher Middle Ages, We're going to start taking a look at some of the developments, both personally for individuals, both at the lay level and at the clergy level. Things like the Black Death, things like war and famine, marriage, all of the things you might experience in everyday life. But we're also going to be looking at some of the developments of the most important institutions of the Middle Ages. We're going to be looking at the rise of various kingdoms and how they warred with one another. So we're going to look at, for example, the Hundred Years' War. We're going to look at the breakdown of society, how it was arranged into three different estates, and how we, if we lived in that day and age, would be classified. And we're going to be taking a look at the developments in the papacy. How did it rise? How did it become strong? And more importantly, what were the challenges it faced as it went through a series of crises? particularly in the latter Middle Ages, as the papacy first was co-opted by the French government and later the papacy itself split into three different papacies, three different popes. In the end, though, I want you to see that the Middle Ages are actually quite a fascinating period.
and that often what has left us in the dark about the Middle Ages is not that the Middle Ages are so irrelevant or that they are opaque or that there's something that is keeping us from really exploring it, but rather that we maybe haven't had the best tour guides on the journey through these years. And so in the end, as we look at the sweep of the development of the Middle Ages, we're going to be looking at all various strata and all various levels of society in the hopes that when we come away from these lectures, we will have a better understanding of the medieval world in order that we can have an understanding of the medieval church with the ultimate goal of eventually better understanding the Protestant Reformation, which broke away from the medieval perspective on faith, theology, and the Bible. Mm -hmm.